Good afternoon. This is Jessica from CorpU, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar on driving disruption, stacking the deck in your favor with David Patrick. Just a few housekeeping items before we begin. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Should you have any issues during the webinar, please type a question into the chat box and someone will help you. Today's webinar is being recorded and the recording and slides will be shared with all attendees. We do encourage you to ask Dave a question during the webinar. Please type a question in the question box and we will get to you. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you Corpus founder and CEO, Alan Todd. Alan? All right. Thank you, Jessica. Welcome, everybody, to Driving Disruption. Uh, I'm very excited to have Dave Patrick with us today. Um, as the CEO of Charles Schwab, Dave led them through transformational change from the, the days of a brick and, board, uh, brick and mortar business with hundreds of branches to a fully integrated digital click and mortar business serving customers seamlessly online and face to face. As a pioneer, Dave wrote the bestseller, Clicks and Mortar, to give business leaders a roadmap for driving disruptive change back in the year 2000. Um, since then, he's been teaching leading breakthrough change at the Wharton School of Business, and he published his second bestseller, Stacking the Deck, where he laid out a new blueprint and roadmap for leading in today's world. So today, Dave's going to give you the roadmap to driving disruption. Uh, and let me first answer two questions that you might be thinking about. And, and the two that I wanted to cover is why does driving disruption matter and why does Corp U matter? Um, and so if we think about the rate uh, of change, it, I think it's safe to say that it will continue to accelerate. And this, this slide simply shows that whereas it used to take 20 years on average to get to a billion dollar uh, or Fortune 500 company, uh, you see that it's happening at an ever increasing pace and if we go back uh, a half century or, or so, the average company lived on the S&P 500 index for 60 years, 50 years, and that is continuing to go down towards 10 years. So suffice it to say, the rate of change will continue to accelerate. And I think the question is, is your culture ready? Can your culture keep up? And Gary Hamill, uh, best-selling author and business thinker, says that, uh, that most companies aren't. And the reason is, is that that a lot of the principles of management that are in place today were born before the end of the Civil War. They were led by people who created the inventions um, that we are still using today. And so Gary Hamill would say that we, we need a complete management revolution if we're going to accommodate a 21st century business world and management and culture. And so something has to change. We know from McKinsey that change efforts fall short 70% of the time or greater. So a super majority of the time when organizations set out a change initiative to lead transformational change, a super majority of the time, they actually never get to that desired end state destination. And if we look at that, while that's also happening, organizations and work are becoming more complex. What we now know is that through a lot of re-engineering of corporations and de-layering and flattening and productivity improvement initiatives over the last 10 to 20 years, that individual contributors now have to collaborate with on average 10 people every day to get their job done. So that's kind of interesting. But if you combine that with, there are several studies that suggest a super majority of the people in an organization can't even name the organization's strategy or don't know what results the organization's trying to achieve. And so if work is more complex, we have to collaborate with more people, the rate of change will continue to get faster. The management practices today, many are stuck in, in last century's order. How might we think about getting out of that? And so that that was my attempt at answering why does driving disruption matter? And I just want to give you the point of view on Corp U and our focus and why we exist at Corp U is to develop leaders who make a difference in the business. And we do that with a strategic learning platform. Our learning platform, it's all about connecting people together in your organization, in purpose-built groups to solve complex problems, generate and spread ideas, teach and learn from each other and from experts, both inside and outside the company, and capture and share that knowledge to be amplified. And you do that to build organizational capabilities to drive success. And we do that in a way that's always focused on solving problems. 
and we work with faculty from world-class institutions like Dave Potrick today. And of course, we have a very powerful AI-driven analytics engine that focuses on measuring high-impact business outcomes from the online programs. So that's kind of the, the big picture about Corp U, and I just, I'll situate it in one more thing. Uh, we've worked with Dave over several years to build the, the world famous program. Dave's won multiple teaching awards at the Wharton School of Business, teaching leading breakthrough change. And we developed um, a set of programs that help you align the, the change sponsors with change champions, with change implementers from the top and middle and all the way to the front line of the organization to build this online program to work on driving uh, change initiatives in your business. And so that's really our stake in all of this. And moving on for today, I'm gonna to turn it over to Dave and he's gonna walk us through his model for driving disruption and go over some of the concepts from stacking the deck. Uh, and uh, without further ado, Dave, if you're there. Thank you. I'm gonna turn it over uh, to you. Here I am, Alan. I'm, here That's I great. am, good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to have you have you here with me. Um, I, I wanna talk about uh, driving disruption this morning with you. And um, Alan has outlined all the reasons why disruptive business strategies are more important than ever. Um, and of course, uh, business leaders uh, used to just have to worry about strategy and strategy X and, and, and you know, getting the big picture strategy right and how can we reduce cost, how can we increase revenue. But now it's so much about strategy execution and talent management. And if you don't, if you're not a, a, a magnet for talent, you need to be a magnet for talent. All of you on this call, your companies and you individually have got to be a magnet for talent because there is a war for talent going on right now. And um, as I think about uh, breakthrough change, uh, these are the, uh, on the screen right now is what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about wh what what happens, what do you need for disruptive change? And there's three things. Number one, you need the right talent. Um, you you can't get you can't get it done uh, with a hard charging, hard working, well meaning group of people who don't have the right skill set. It just won't work. So. So we need to figure out how we're going to get the right talent. And number two, uh, we need to have the leadership skills to get all that talent to work together effectively. Uh, that's a whole topic that is that is uh, uh, rich with for conversation. And then the th the third thing is we need a process, and we need a process that will. Um, build momentum and buy-in, and that process um, has to build not only real momentum, it has, to, it has to build a perception of momentum. So we're going to talk a little bit about, about each of these things uh, today. So let's start with, um, with, with talent. Um, you know, in, in my experience, and in my experience, right up to the present time, the issue of looking at your team thoughtfully and honestly and assessing do we have the talent to accomplish the mission ahead, oftentimes the truth is we don't. We have people who've been part of our team for a long time, they're terrific contributors, but they don't have the skills, they, 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 they've never done what we're about to do. They don't have the change management skills. They don't have either the technology skills, the marketing skills. We're all getting in a world where, where new, and, new types of experiences are needed, and we can't simply uh, get there with the old team. So I, I, I would suggest to you that if you think about the people you have working for you, and you think about the weakest contributors you have, and having done this kind of talk, hundreds of times to live audiences that are in the room with me. When I look around the room and I say, how many of you are carrying someone on your team who's been part of your team for maybe a decade, but is struggling and you're hoping they'll catch up 
and I don't ask for a show of hands because my I'm not in the business of embarrassing people, but they, I see a lot of guilty faces in the room. And the truth of the matter is, in my experience, those people will not, will not rise to the occasion over time. They will not be able to. And so you'll have a conversation with them a year or two from now, which would be no more difficult than the, or no easier, excuse me, than the conversation you would have with them today. And so what I have found for myself, the, my ability to be tough-minded about this issue is the hardest personal issue that I face. It is really hard for me to say goodbye to people that I have a personal relationship with, but I'm here to tell you that we don't, we don't have the luxury of just adding more and more people to our teams, so we have to trade up. And, and I, I encourage you to, to think about how you're going to do that. Uh, the other thing I would mention is that you have to be constantly thinking about building a network um, as you travel around, as you go to conferences, as you meet people. You have to be building your contact list of how you are going to recruit and, and where the people are going to come from. You've got to be thinking of yourself as always in the business of recruiting, um, recruiting talent for upgrading your teams. Let's, let's move on. I think we've, we've covered that subject. Let's move on and talk about um, leadership skills. So in, in the world of leadership skills, so one of the things I try to point out to people is that we often use the words motivation and inspiration interchangeably as if they're the same thing. Well, they're not. Um, motivation is the exchange of rewards for behaviors, and that doesn't work with disruption. And why is that? And the answer is because there's too much risk, there's too much hard work, and in most of the companies that we all work for, the rewards are not sufficient to um, to reward the kind of behavior we want. So if, if motivation is not enough, what, what about inspiration? Well, inspiration is about our ability as leaders to inspire people to want to create something great, to want to be part of a journey to, to create something differentiated and special. And that means we need to communicate our own passion about why is this something we're excited about. And, and that comes from um, our, uh, where we talk about our personal experiences that often involve meeting customers, meeting prospects, being out in the world, convincing ourselves that something that we need to do, something that we're not doing is going to be desired in the marketplace because our customers need something other than what we're doing today. Uh, the fact that we have a strategic plan, the fact that we've done market research, the fact that we have a million numbers is less compelling than stories that we would tell about what people need and, and our own experiences uh, with, with customers and prospects. I, I, uh, spent a lot of time exposing my senior leaders to customers and prospects on a continuous basis when I was in, at Schwab, when I was in my most recent company called Hightower. You, you have to be out talking to customers so that you understand um, what, what, where their passions are, what they need, and uh, there's just absolutely no, no, um, uh, there's no replacement for that. The other thing I would mention about leadership is that oftentimes leaders, either ourselves or people that we see, they get to where they are based upon their competence. They're the best marketer. They're the best financial person. Um, whatever that, that talent is within their technical discipline, 
they're really good at it. And so they move up. They move up in the organization. But the 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 more and more senior we become, it's less about our ability, our competence, that it gives us leadership quality. It's about our ability to connect. And our ability to connect is about our uh, transparency, our willingness to reveal ourselves, to talk about our our ourselves as human beings and explaining to our teams why something is important to us, where our personal passion comes from. And I would say that um, oftentimes we try to do this electronically, and electronically it really doesn't work very well. This is not something we're able to communicate in an email or a video. These are the kind of things we need to communicate in face-to-face -face meetings. I like to say that we earn the right to communicate electronically by the quality and frequency of our face-to-face -face communications. It's our authenticity to admit mistakes, to admit our learnings, to admit the things we've done wrong that give us our credibility where people are willing to listen to us and follow us. And this um, this quality where we can connect with the people who work for us and inspire them to want to be part of this journey to create something great is um, absolutely critical to our ability to lead a disruptive change. So let's move on now and let's talk a little bit about, about process. Uh, Alan, why don't we flip the slide so we can start going through the steps here, at least um, uh, briefly. So, okay. Um, the, the, the process, I, I'm, I, don't, I wouldn't suggest there's only one way to lead disruptive change, but we, we had a couple, or we had more than a couple uh, of major initiatives during my days at Schwab, which I didn't take the time to cover with you today because I prefer to focus on the substance of, of this talk, but um, we, met, we reinvented our company several times to fundamentally change what we did and how we did it. We adopted technology. We built out a retail branch network. We reinvented what we wanted our branch network to do. We built a brand new back office for uh, a special set of clients. We got ourselves away from equities and into the mutual fund industry. Um, we did a whole bunch of things like that. And, and as a result of my successes and my failures, I, we, we went international. That was a horrible failure. So as a result of the various successes and failures we had, I, I developed my thinking about a step-by-step -step process that, a bit, that drives our ability to bring people together and to get them to move forward uh, to support disruptive change. The one thing I would say um, before I go any further is the mistake I made over and over. I mean, it's, it's, as I look back, it sort of astounds me that I could have made the same mistake so many times, is that once I, I had a certain idea for a disruptive change to our business model, and I went out and I talked to customers and I talked to prospects and I talked to frontline employees. Those are the people I always got my ideas from. And we came up with an idea, a strategy. I consistently believed, oh my God, this is so great. Everyone's going to love this. And of course, they never loved it. They always hated it. And it was very easy for me to fall in love with the new strategy, the innovation, the, the 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 disruptive change we were making um, because I spent a lot of time talking to customers and they convinced me that this was going to be a great success and I would go out and try to talk to people about this and I always believed they would get it and the truth of the matter is they don't. So this first step of establish the need to change and a sense of urgency I need you to appreciate how hard that is. 
It's not just gathering the research and figuring out the strategy and having a strategy consultant come in and tell you this is what you need to do. You need to add online capability. You need to be more um, uh, technological. You need, customers need to have an easier way to do business with you. You need to reduce your pricing. Whatever those things are, that always seems like, okay, well, those are the things we have to do. You need to appreciate the pushback you're going to get is going to be extraordinary. And the pushback you're likely to get, even from your inner team, will be pretty severe. So the process of step one, establishing the need to change in a sense of urgency, figuring out, understanding how much fear will be involved, and, and then moving to step two, to recruit and unify this inner team, the inner team that's going to make this work <laughs> is really hard because that inner team has to be on board. They have to, they have, and, and they may not be on board at first, but they have to be willing to be convinced and get on board and become advocates with you. I, I say here, we have to build trust. We have to face and resolve conflict. All of that has to be worked out so this inner team is on board. Okay, let's talk about steps three and four. Let's flip the slide. Okay, so um, in step three, we begin to develop and communicate a clear and compelling vision uh, outside of your inner circle. You start, to, you start to describe this to a broader and broader set of people, and you're doing that concurrent with step four, which is understanding potential barriers. The potential barriers are old procedures that get in the way. It's not just, do we have the money? People say, well, you know, do we have the money to do this? It's, that, that's almost the easier part. It, it's, do we have the culture? Does our culture support our, our doing this? Is our culture gonna be in the way? Do we have old rules that everybody follows that, that make what we're doing so difficult? Uh, so we really need to understand um, culture, rules, processes, talent, the kind of barriers that get in the way of developing a, and communicating a, com a compelling vision. Because we're about to get to step five, which is about creating a, a workable plan. Let's go to the next slide. So we have this plan, but I will tell you that if we don't think about the barriers quickly, you won't get to step five because step five, up until now, we've had this inner circle and it's a fairly tight circle of people and we're now starting to go broader. And as we start to go broader, the those who don't like the change and there will always be for a whole host of reasons, people who will be digging in to stop this change from happening and they're going to say, okay, no, we're not going to, we don't want to do this. This, this changes my importance to the company. My skill set is no longer as valuable. It's very personal reasons or simply I'm uncomfortable. I don't know what this means. I don't know where this goes. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to resist. And so um, understanding those barriers and preparing for them lets you start to bring in the other people you're going to need. You're going to need to broaden your 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 um your 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 network of people to develop this plan because the plan can't be done in isolation. And then um, as we look at the plan, I talked about we need a process that builds momentum and the perception of momentum. And in step six, we take the change initiative and we really start to think about um, manageable pieces. What can we what can we do? that can be celebrated as interim successes. Real disruptive change happens over time. It takes years. It, it's not, it's not a, a, a breakthrough disruptive change doesn't happen in six months or a year. It, it's usually a, 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 a 12, 18, 24 month kind of process. And so therefore we need to have in, in six to nine months, little um, uh, executable milestones that we can celebrate as successes.
that we can view and build within the company as evidence of progress to build a perception that there is momentum, that we are winning, that we are succeeding. Here's the fact. If your project has very few evidences of success within a year, you will start to see people gravitating away. You run the risk that your budget starts to get cut. You run the risk that some of your people transfer to other parts of the company. It's hard to hold the team together and have everyone working as hard as they need to work if we don't have celebrations of interim successes. Okay, let's move on to step seven and eight now. Okay, so we're now, we're now getting to the point where we have, um, we have um, a, something, we have something that's happening and we're getting to the point where we have um, a product, a process, a new way of doing business um, that we can start to, to, to roll out in the marketplace. And I, I have, there is such energy around getting it out right away. I try to encourage my, um, the companies I run or the people I advise, I try to encourage them to do pilots before they, they um, roll these things out um, uh, across the board. There, there's nothing more important than, than controlling a, more, a smaller implementation in the beginning because usually we don't have the resources to recover from setbacks that if we did something smaller, we would be able to fix it. We would be able to regroup. We've done something in a small set of locations. We've done something with a small set of customers. The, you, you, you think you know what the customer reaction is going to be. You think you understand how successful something's going to be, but there is no, no replacement for what we actually find out in the market. And so I, I try to encourage um, a, a pilot of some sort, and I, I talk about different types of pilots. There's something I call a stack pilot. There's something I call a scalability pilot. Uh, I don't have time to go over all that this morning with you, but they're, they're in, my, in my book. And uh, I think one of the wonderful benefits of pilots is that you now have employees from the field, people who are out serving customers, people who are out um, um, working in the field, making these kinds of rollouts of new ideas and new, new service offerings, um, they can be advocates to the rest of the company because they probably were somewhat skeptical to begin with, and then they did this new way of doing business, whatever it is, a product, a, a service offering, a process, and now they are part of the believers and their credibility with their colleagues is probably greater than management. Um, and then finally, we, we need to make sure we understand how to roll out, how to roll out now that we've tested, we've created a, 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 an ability to be successful, we understand what it is we're doing, um, we, we understand how to be successful and we roll out, and that's the final step of this, uh, this disruptive change. Um, one of the things I, I talk about in my book is um, this idea, is it okay to fail? I used to get that question all the time. Dave, is it okay to fail? And the way I would answer that question is, um, it's okay to fail under certain circumstances. And, and if it's not okay to fail, then people don't want to take risks. Now, I used to say, uh, well, look, it's, it's not good to fail, but there's noble failure. There are certain conditions. We've done the planning. We've, we've done our homework. We've, we've managed the downside risk. We've planned out contingencies. We have not bet the company. We can overcome this failure. There's, there's a number, six or seven criteria that makes for what I would call noble failure, in which case employees don't aren't necessarily rewarded for failing, but neither are they penalized. They're that much more experienced now, but they failed. It did not work, it failed. But there's no there's no capital punishment, corporate version of capital punishment. 
if you had noble failure. So that I think you need to build a culture where people understand that not everything we're going to try is going to work. But if we take that thoughtful approach, if we take a, 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 a the approach like the one I've, I've outlined in this eight step approach, then um, we we can, you know, go back to work on something else and, you know, sort of live live to play another day in the in the corporate world. And I think, Alan, that's what I wanted to cover this morning. All right, Dave, thanks for the uh, for for sharing the roadmap with everybody. And uh I'd like to ask if you have any questions for Dave, put them into the question panel. So I have some uh, coming in right now. Please uh, tee up your thoughts for Dave. So Dave, the first question I wanted to ask is, you talked about the biggest mistake, falling in love with the newest idea um, that you heard from customers or from the field. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering in one thing that we've seen is organizations uh, we hear that they get into initiative overload because they're trying out so many new ideas that the people are just fatigued by the whole thing. Um, and I wonder if you could talk about initiative overload and, and fatigue and ways that you might advise people to, to, to deal with this issue. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point, Alan. Uh, I, I, we, we had that at Schwab and, you know, we, we always said, and we said it at Intel where I was on the board for 20 years, we can do almost anything, but we can't do everything. And um, I think that's that's where sort of you get to the benefit of some kind of a annual budget slash planning process where you, you sort of try to bring ideas to the table that have been vetted, they've been researched, they've been thought about, they've been, you've gone through some of the stage one, stage two, stage three kind of uh, work and now you've got a plan, and and it may be that that plan has to be backburnered because something else is is more important. I, I do think that um, there's going to be ups and downs in these disruptive projects. There, there's learning. There's 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 uh, one of the things I didn't cover today is well, what happens if things are not going well, and that mean that may mean that we don't have a product market fit and we have to test our assumptions and regroup a little bit and go back to the market which is one of the benefits of having done a pilot implementation we haven't we haven't wasted our resources rolling out something that actually doesn't work as as well as we we hoped it would but i i think it's up to us and who are senior leaders to recognize we can do a lot of things, but we can't do everything. And I think it's just it's just discipline, Alan, to to make choices and to understand. And I think if you're talking to your customers, you have some sense of where their greatest frustrations are. I mean, our job is not to go out and tell ask customers, do you like what we're doing? Your your job is to talk to customers and ask them, what are we not doing that you need? What what would you like to see from us that we don't do today if, if, if imagine price is no object what what would make your socks roll up and down if we could find a way to do something that would really delight you so you have to get some client input and then you got to set some priorities because you can't do everything yep okay got it so i think on the uh the initiative overload um, that being tighter around the way you plan and discuss those things, and I guess I suppose budget and fund initiatives and sticking to it and killing them early and the ones that aren't viable through pilots um, makes a lot of sense. I'm wondering if you could elaborate a little bit, Dave, going. How do you iterate through this process of getting the buy-in from an inner circle and then you slowly build it, I, I imagine, to this broader group you describe, and then you iterate further to an even broader group? Um, can you talk about how how that works? Well, I, I, I think that um, we don't get there. We don't get there through, pers you know, pounding through persuasion. I, I believe that as leaders, we need, to, we need to engage with our people. We need to engage with our people to gain the same insight that, that that you gain. So what, what I mean by that is um, the 
had over the years customers. And so the way I engaged with the, my inner circle and then a broader circle was to bring those same customers or different customers um, into uh, into the room and 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 have my my team hear it from the customer. I, I think all too often we think we're going to persuade senior managers above us or boards above us. We all report to somebody, uh, even if you're CEO, you have a board. We think we're going to persuade them with numbers. And and I've just found that numbers only go so far. There's nothing like um, actually hearing it from a customer, seeing the look on their face, seeing the power of their conviction, the energy they have when they talk about something. Um, that kind of experience, Alan, is far more powerful than you're standing there pounding the table telling people how, how much conviction you have over this. Bring them into the discovery process. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, bringing in the, the voice of the customer. Can, can we uh, let's let's keep going, Dave? And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on um, do you believe today's leaders are building technological know-how at a pace to keep change with rapid shifts in business models? Say that question again. Well, it's it's are they building technological know-how um, fast enough to keep up? So I know we know. I guess technology okay. companies are doing this, but the question is, how, how's everybody else doing in terms of building that? tech know-how or how important is that to keep up? Well, yeah. So, so, so what I'm hearing you ask me are, are the leaders of companies um, keeping up with the potential, the technological potential in the market? What, what capabilities are being created with big data, artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, uh, broadband technologies? How, how do these uh, trends and new new uh, technologies affect our strategic planning processes about where we should be going, and are those capabilities, knowledge, and potentialities getting into the boardroom, the the executive room, etc.? Is is that indeed the question you're asking me? Yep, yep, you got it, yep. and you've elaborated yep. on yep. it well. Yeah, yeah. The the answer is it's not, and and I think that. Um, we have we have too many boards of directors who have um, the wrong people on the boards. They have they have maybe wonderful um, senior executive talent, but oftentimes the you know who who has the time to be on boards? It's often people who's who are now retired, who's who have, are in the the later stages of their careers, um, and they're just not they're not where where. Uh, the leader, the leaders of technology are. So again, Alan, I think I think you need to you need to bring in um, you need to invite in uh, uh, the, the the disruptors, the technological disruptors. I don't think we need. I think there's a really important distinction between being on the bleeding edge of technology and being on the leading edge. And I I think it's it, you want to avoid the bleeding edge those things that maybe will work and maybe won't work. But there's enough going on on the leading edge of technology, the way video is being used today, the things that you're doing at CorpU, for example, to try to reinvent corporate training so people don't have to travel to a seminar, but they can dial in, they can be real time, they can watch video, video plus real time, so they can get, they can get trained without having necessarily to be physically in a certain place. And, and I think oftentimes uh, our leaders are not aware because because the, their company's not doing it, and they don't know who to trust to bring in um, experts that can describe the the state of the art of of what what ought to be done. So I think that that's something that companies have to build into their planning process. Yeah, I think that that makes a lot of sense, and I think it it matches what what we see in the public press, which is that there are there are very few companies that seem to be building technological capabilities at an accelerating pace, and they're sort of getting the re reaping the windfall, and everyone else is uh, m getting left behind. So the so the struggle is getting even well, more I difficult. Of, but I think part of the problem, uh, Alan, is figuring out who you can trust. I mean, if if you invite 
uh, IBM to come in and talk to you about artificial intelligence, um, they'll do a wonderful job, but you sit there and wonder, are they just trying to sell me something because they have a vested interest in my buying what they're selling? So you've, you've got to figure out who, who can talk to you in a way where um, uh, what you're getting is objective, is objective information and not just a sales pitch. Yeah, yeah, I think that, that makes a tremendous amount of sense. Uh, I wonder, Dave, if we could uh, we shift. You, you mentioned a couple times um, culture, and, and that's something that, that we pay attention to a lot at Corpio, which is culture change. And I think uh, a lot of the reasons why big breakthrough change projects underperform, as you've pointed out many times, has to do with culture and pushback and all of that. Can you, do you have some thoughts on how leaders shape culture? Well, how does sure. a leader drive um, it? Right. So, um, in many companies, the culture is something that people talk about, but they actually don't really talk about at a level of detail. So, what, what is culture? Culture are the the written or unwritten values that drive a company and drive the rules, the written and unwritten rules of behavior about how, how we act as a company. So the culture affects how we value employees. It affects how we value customers. So, you know, you can have a culture statement, which is a mission statement that says, our mission is to put the customer first at every turn. And then what the day-to-day -day act, actions of the company are is to turn down requests for is to not you know not accept returns and ref and refunds for customers um and and so you you don't live up to that that value statement and then you have other companies um who we all know people like Amazon where you can send stuff back and they are incredibly customer focused uh customer companies like Zappos where they they um uh, they pay for the shipping of returning uh product and they and they fundamentally expect you to order three pairs of shoes, keep the one pair that fits the best and send the other two back, but they have somehow built it into their business model that they can still be successful with with doing business that way. And so I think I think where the where the problems exist is companies who have um uh culture statements around caring for employees and caring for customers but but they don't they don't live up to that and and in a world of tightening budgets suddenly the cost of health insurance to the employee is going up the level of service on their health insurance is going down there's um layoffs every year and there's so there's there's job insecurity there's there's compensation reductions and little things like that, and then they want the employees to be devoted to the company and devoted to the customer. It's just not going to happen. So I, I, I think that um, if you want a culture that is really um, forward-looking and where people are all in, you, you have to start with the culture that thinks about and values employees and treats them in, and, and that it not, not only treats them well, but everybody walks the talk. You know, people people do um, the. We always say leadership is how you act when no one's looking, and I think that's that's about culture. The culture is real when people live up to the values stated in the culture when no one's looking, and it, it doesn't happen enough, Alan. Yeah, yeah. Well, I hear you with all the the, the sort of the mismatch problems where they're not walking the talk. So you look at it, and I think. The world is filled with companies where the the written values are put on a wall, and you ask people how how does that best reflect the the culture here, and and people you'll get the eye rolling, and and uh, I, I think that's probably far too common, um, sadly. Yeah. So let me yeah. let let's let me just ask another question related, just building off of culture. Um, you you talk about getting the talent right, and I'm wondering how often do you think people get the talent right? And the second question to that is, what are the most common mistakes you see in all this get the right people, be a talent magnet, and so on? Well, um, I, I think 
the sad thing, I mean, this is really painful for me to say, but um, you, you have to have you have to have a company where um, you have the discipline to say goodbye to people who have been very valued contributors, but who are just not keeping up with with getting their their talents upgraded and where they're 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 still valuable today like they were years ago. If the company is growing and evolving, someone who might have been your head of HR um, or your CFO or your controller, uh, the company's bigger and more complicated now, and that person who's really been so devoted is just not up to the task at hand. And what, what I see is that people carry, carry underperformers that they really can't afford to carry. Then they go out and hire other people. They don't get rid of the people they have to say goodbye to. And um, I, I, I really have made this mistake myself. I, I, <laughs> I, I could look to recent experiences where I've made this mistake. So I absolutely appreciate how difficult it is. But in a world where things are changing as, as quickly as they are, You've got to add people who have talents that are needed for the new ways of doing business. And we can't just add. Sometimes we have to replace. More often than not, we have to replace. And that replacing process is very, very painful. The other thing I think um, uh, people need to do is they need to understand that um, – you've got to be constantly sort of thinking like you're a recruiter. And so you go to conferences, you go to meetings, you go to events, you put yourself in target rich environments where you're going to meet people. And when you meet them, you, you get their business cards, you, you get to know them. You, and you think, is this someone I, you know, down the road, is this someone I, I would future, it would be a future recruit of mine and maybe not a recruit, but maybe a, a reference for someone else that they know um, you've got to have a personal network. You know, in, 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 uh, 30 years ago, we said we would have said you need a Rolodex. Nobody knows what that is anymore. But you, you, you need a network. You need a network of people. Um, you don't have time. If, if you need a new um, a security, uh, someone to lead your security practice it, or your security process in your company, you you don't feel like you have you have the right leader in, of your security and you see what's going on with hacking and so forth. I mean, it's hard to hire a search firm and engage in a six to nine month process. It just seems like it takes too long to do that. Um, and, and if you do, do want, do want to do that, you certainly don't want to start interviewing search firms because you've never met anybody. And now you're trying to figure out who you're going to use or, figure out if you're going to use an online capability. You need to be thinking about this stuff today. How would you do this? Um, search, if you're going to use a search firm, you got to realize that search firm is not only screening candidates, they're selling you and why that candidate who's so high profile, so capable, and probably pretty happy where they are, should consider a job shift to come to work for the comp your company and you. And if they don't understand your company and they don't understand you, how can they show you? So you have to spend enough time with search firms or recruiters or even your own internal recruiters so they understand that part of what you're selling is the company, but you're also selling the, the, the boss. Who's that person going to be reporting to? That's part of the, 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 the sale. Yep. Well, I know these uh, the, the the talent issues and getting that right. I think you've made it crystal clear. That's that's step one and and one of the hardest things is making sure um, that 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 you've got the right people. Um, and and let's talk a little bit if we can move on, uh, Dave, to to influence. And we're getting near the end, so uh, this might be our last question or second to last. But this one comes from Donna, and it says, "How can we who are leading change management efforts?" inspire the VPs and directors to inspire their divisions so lower level employees agree and support change? So this question is how do we as change leaders um, uh, get the line managers to whom the people report to, to understand the importance of inspiration and, and not just think they're gonna get there by, by issuing orders, this is what you have to do, these are the new procedures 
get in line or you're in trouble? Is that the question? Yeah, that's it. How to inspire those other divisions so that they're getting to the lower level yeah. people in to support the change. Well, um, I, I, this, this is, is a, a hard thing to do. Um, it, it needs to start a, at the very beginning. So when, um, even though, even though I was CEO of Schwab, the notion that because I said we're going to do something, everyone was going to jump in line and sell it to their staff because the CEO issued an order that that's just not, that's just not realistic. It just doesn't happen that way. There's got to be persuasion and it's a lot easier to be persuasive when you're managing down than obviously managing up. But when I, when I talk to my, my uh, middle management MBA students that I, I deal with each year, uh, I always tell them that you need to bring, you need to bring the people who you work for, you need to bring them into the circle of exposure to customers. And I said this several times today, and I, I, I apologize for the repetition, but I, I just find there's too many senior executives, division managers and leaders who manage from behind the desk, looking at reports and looking at numbers. And if, if you're, you know, two levels down and you need those leaders to get out and sell the change, you need to first sell them. That means you need to get them exposure to the customers that have convinced you that this is where you need to go. The prospects, the technology leaders, you, you, can't, you can't assume that they have that. Someone may have told them that they need to be supportive, but they're really not supportive. Well, expose them to the same elements of, of, of um, persuasion. And remember, over and over, tell yourself, numbers don't do it. Numbers don't convince people. Numbers don't, don't, don't bring people's emotions. It's, it's human contact. It's stories. It's stories that um, compel people. And, and if you can get them to hear the stories from the customer directly, that's the best way to do it. And if they won't go out with you to meet the customer, bring the customers in to meet them. Have a lunch in your office with 10 customers and bring the executives in to talk to them. We'll hear what they have there to say. Yep, there you go. I love that. So, uh, and I think that's really good advice. Numbers don't convince, but human stories, especially customer stories, do. Uh, brilliant. So uh, that brings us to uh, we're coming up to the top of the hour. And uh, so, Dave, I want to uh, I'm going to thank you, but I want to let everybody know that starting next week we have a a five day. Um, open enrollment program. So we're running a version um, of your leading breakthrough change program uh, called Making Change Happen. So it's a one week uh, uh, open enrollment class. And for those who are on the webinar today, uh, we're offering guest passes. So if you want to see or experience the, uh, the, it's 30 minutes a day for five days next week. So it's a two and a half hours with a live uh, a live session uh, one hour session as a capstone event at the end of the week. Um, that's called Making Change Happen. Um, and the, the, our expert faculty is David Potrick, New York Times bestselling author, former CEO of Charles Schwab, Wharton faculty, the guy who's been talking to us for the last 55 minutes. Um, so I wanted to make sure everybody knew about uh, the, the Making Change Happen course. And then we have a, uh, a mini course that are only 10 minutes a day um, on on leading deep change, which is uh, from Bob Quinn from the University of Michigan's Ross School, um, and finally I will close with we uh, next month's webinar is from Mario Musa, who Dave you probably know Mario because he teaches at uh, Wharton with you uh, among other places, and uh, he's a best-selling author of The Art of Woo and does uh, practicing strategic persuasion. So it's really a nice build off of what you talked about today, Dave moving. Um, uh, next month, going a little deeper into the art of persuasion. And so Mario has a best-selling book just on influence and persuasion. So I think uh, that might be helpful to build on this. But Dave, I just want to say on behalf of all of our guests today, thank you for joining us. Thank you for sharing your work and your passion, um, your steps, uh, information from your book. Uh, we're certainly thrilled to have you as a CorpU faculty member and have you on today's webinar. And we're certainly thrilled to be able to make available to everybody a guest pass so they can experience 
making change happen, a small uh, sample of your uh, program on leading breakthrough change with Corpio. So thanks again, Dave. My pleasure, Alan. I, I hope this has been beneficial for your listeners. I'm sure that it has been wonderful. We had a lot of uh, interaction and questions. So I uh, greatly appreciate your time. Thank you, everyone, for your time. And uh, have a great rest of the week and make it a great weekend. Thanks again.